society. And when we have, for example, now we look at what is happening in Muslim majority countries and we have education for male and not enough for female, wrong. Because طلب العلم فريدة على كل مسلم ومسلمة. So seeking knowledge is an obligation for men and women. So any society which is not providing equal rights to knowledge is not following in the footsteps of this message. Which is the starting point of being critical. And for poor and rich, because it's a basic right. So now you can talk about the United States of America. Because some were very happy I was talking about the Muslim majority countries. But you can speak about every society, the Western society, the way that we are treating pe poor people in our society, the basic knowledge, the basic uh, educational rights are not protected. That's wrong. The point for me here is just to say, when it comes to this, is to get it right that uh, um, with the first revelation, and, 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 and it was talking, we were talking about asking questions and in the personal journey, knowledge. And with knowledge, if we want to put meaning into action, you need to go from knowledge to understanding. And this is two words that we have in Arabic, al-ilm, which is knowledge, al-fahm, which is understanding things. Understanding, you can't get this if you just understand the texts that are revealed. One of the main points, one of the main dimension in the Prophet's life, which is very important, wherever he was and when he was living in Mecca and when he was living in Medina, there is something which is so central in anything which is his mission. He got the knowledge from the text, but he knew the knowledge. He got the, new, the knowledge of the context. He knew with whom he was living. He was understanding the people. You can't just come with a spiritual message and you don't understand the people with whom you live. Knowing the people is as important as knowing the text because you need to convey the text to the people. So this is where it's very important for any spiritual life to listen to what the people are experiencing, to be close to them, to serve them. And this is the way he was. So the first dimension of this spirituality is ask the question, listen to the answer, get knowledge, and try to understand. And you, you get it right. Spirituality is not to pray during the night only. Spirituality is to put meaning in everything in your life. When you get the knowledge, when you try to understand, is to get the understanding. It's to give meaning to everything you are doing. At the end of the day, spirituality should not be on the margin of your life. It should be the light of meaning at the center of your life. This is what we got from his life, that this is the way he was building, shaping, constructing himself and his community. So this is the first dimension. It's an intellectual journey. But there is something different, a second dimension. And something which it's part of spirituality. What are we trying to reach? And this is the way I was saying at the beginning that I discovered after a long time and trying to explain Islam and I was giving lectures, you know, it was a long time ago that I started. And then all of, a, all of a sudden when I was writing, say, okay, I'm missing the point. I am taking a, a means to the end as the end is peace, is salam. And this is something which is, what if you listen to what the Buddhists are telling you? If you listen to what the, the Jewish mystical tradition or orthodox tradition or the Christian tradition and among them also the mystical tradition, if you listen to what the mainstream Muslim scholars are saying at the end of the day, if you try to understand his life, and this is what I was trying to get when I was writing about him, at the end of the day what he was trying to get for himself and what the text was telling him and what God was calling him to achieve is one thing which is essential. He is inner peace. It's to feel good. If when you are, for example, you have principles in which you believe and you, you have your own life, you will be at peace where the principles are matching with your acts and actions. This is why we have it in the Quran, الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا وَعَمِلُوا الصَّالِحَاتِ Those who are 
believing and do good deeds. In fact, their principles are visible in their behavior. And you get peace when your principles are consistent or your uh, behavior is consistent with your principles, but not only. You will get peace, for example, with your body when your needs are matched with you tried to, you, you, you got the way to satisfy your needs. And this is something which is uh, essential if we want to understand spirituality. Spirituality is all about getting peace. So if you come back to his life and try to say, okay, how was he talking about this? He was telling us something which is important. First, look at your needs and acknowledge the fact that you have needs. Don't try to say that you are an angel because you are not. You have needs, you have expectation, and you are trying to satisfy them. First thing is to acknowledge the fact that you have needs. The second thing is be careful not all your needs are good. Because some of your needs sometimes in our society, and this is why it's important in our industrialized societies today, is now people and fashions are creating needs. So we are always unsatisfied because we always have needs after needs. So if you got the iPhone 4, wake up. 4S is coming. <laughs> but that's the, 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 the psychology behind it is always sure searching and trying to get the one which is, and it's a mindset that is created. You are in a state of dependency. And if you don't master this dependency, it's, it becomes addiction. And if you are addicted, you are not independent. And if you are not independent, no peace. No peace. Peace is coming from this independence. This kind of, you get what you want, but you master what you want in order to be at peace. So you have to master this. So this is why I was saying no spirituality without discipline, because you have to discipline your needs. And not all your needs, and by the way, not everything which is natural is good. You know why? Because violence is natural. It's not good. You have to master your violence. Selfishness is natural. You, don't, you, you were not born democrat and generous. Quite the opposite. It was always me first. You have to be educated to come say, it's me and you. And it might be you and me. And you are taught when you speak, say, first you say you and me. It's not good to say me and you. What does it mean this? The only situation when you have to start with yourself is in a state of uh, security or when you are in danger. When you are in the plane, say, first you start with protecting yourself and you help the other which is exactly what is said in all the spiritualities when you are facing your own death. And when you are praying God, you start with yourself and then with the people you love. But you know that uh, it's always like this, that you have to think about your own situation at the, when it comes to the limits. My point here is try to get this understanding. So that we have needs and to acknowledge. And when you look at his life, you understand that he was touching all these dimensions and talking about them. For example, the first basic needs that we have, of course, is to eat. Any society which is not giving you what you need to eat and to survive is acting against your basic human rights. It's against your dignity. This is why we have something in the Islamic tradition saying, uh, uh, meaning poverty can lead you towards denying God because this is not acceptable with human beings you need to have the needs to the, it's, it's a basic need that you have uh, uh, to satisfy and there is no question we all agree on this and this is a universal message but it means that we are undermining the spiritual experience of the poor people if we don't we are not serious about this we are not, it's a question of justice spiritual justice and justice for more spirituality. It's not only this. It's something which is also has to do with your needs to be 
loved and to be touched and to be uh, to, 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 to get tenderness and love from the people around you. This is something which is essential in the Islamic tradition. And you have to acknowledge this. Yes, I need to be first respected, my dignity, but I need to be loved because my heart needs this. Half of your religion is to get married. What does it mean? It means respect your body, respect your heart. While he was fasting during Ramadan, his own wife was saying, he was used to kiss and to caress. He was a human being. I'm, I'm fasting for God, but I, I'm a human being. I'm not denying my humanity. I'm not denying the fact that I need sexuality. That if you do it right, is as if you are praying. This is spiritual. There is spirituality in sexuality. Get that right. That's so essential. That spirituality is not, oh, I, I'm alone. No, no, it's not loneliness. It's meaning with people. And this is the way he was teaching the people. They were even, uh, they were just surprised. If I, I, I just go for, with my wife, it's, it's, it's right. It's as, if, it's as if I am praying. It's a sadaqah. It's as if, it's, it's, it's as if I'm, I'm showing something towards God. Yes, if you do it right if you are respecting the limits, if this is right, so even if you respond to the needs of your body, you are in a spiritual mode. Because you don't forget the meaning in every single thing that you are doing. So it's to respond to your basic needs when it comes to your intellect, but your body as well, and to acknowledge this, that uh, you need to be loved. And this is why he was saying to all the companions, tell and someone came to him and said, you know this one, I love him. And so he told him, did you tell him? I said, no. I said, go and tell him. Tell him I love you. So as we are shy, we always add, in God. I love you in God. Because it could be dangerous nowadays. But this is the way. I love you. And I, I, we need to hear this. Which is, and this is why, you know, when I was in South America, and I, I was meeting with, I working at the grassroots level with people in, in you know, uh, people who were working and serving the poor there. And I, I was meeting with people and say, and they were saying, you know, God is love. And they helped me out of this encounter to come back to something which is essential in Islam, which is Islam is a message of love. So it's always good to, ca to encounter people from other religions because sometimes they, they bring you to the center of your own. But then you are forgetting, you talk about halal and haram every time, it's lawful and unlawful, and you forget love. And for 25 years, every single lesson that I'm ending with my students, I keep on repeating, don't forget to tell the people you love that you love them. Because it's essential. And it's academic as well. You can bring it within academia. So, you get the point here that this spiritual dimension is part of what he was uh, 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 saying and, 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 and trying to get this, the heart, the body, uh, the intellect. And you will be in a spiritual, experience spirituality if you get this salam, so this peace within, with your heart, with your body. So just to get it, oh, I'm, I'm trying to get peace with my heart and I'm denying the, the, the needs of my, my body is not going to work. I'm trying to get the, because some are forgetting this, you know, the needs of their uh, uh, heart and minds and only they, they are very much obsessed with the needs of their body, it's not going to work. It's all a question of balancing. And it means mastering your needs and know what is right and at the same time trying to fulfill uh, uh, them and, and to control this. And it means at the same time that the only way to get freedom is to control your emotions and not the opposite. And this is something that we know now. I don't know if you have heard. Of course, you have heard, and, and I hope that you have read the book uh, um, Emotional Intelligence. And I'm talking about the book in the, in the quest for meaning and saying, be careful, because sometimes we think that our emotions are making us free. 
And in fact, it's not really true. You are free when you master your emotions, not you are following your emotions, because uh, it's, it, we can't control your emotions. If someone is coming to tell you, I'm free because I do whatever I want, you stop him or her and say, okay, are you sure that you want what you want? And this is something which is the essence of the spiritual journey. So having said that, the last point here for me, it's, I, I want you to understand that all this is coming out of his life, the way he was dealing with people, the way he was dealing with himself, the way he was respecting and just showing them that he had needs and he, he was trying to control the needs and at the same time get that peace. The, 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 the other thing which is important is if you, you are experiencing a spiritual life, you are going also to face something which was faced by all the messengers and all the prophets and all the people who are spreading wisdom among human beings is adversity, that the people are going to attack you, that the people are not going to accept everything uh, that is coming out of you. Even people we, which were who were not within the monotheistic tradition. If you just simply uh, try to understand the life of Socrates, you can understand that he was condemned to be killed uh, because he was, he was perceived as someone who was subversive with the young people within his society. And if, when you read Socrates, it's all about wisdom, controlling, uh, loving truth, and, and at the end, the society rejected him. And there is something that we find in his life, and we'll find this in Jesus' life, in Moses' life, in all the messengers and all, you know, the Buddha and everything which is part of the spirituality is that you are spreading something which is good. Don't expect all the people to love you. You need to face, and you need to know how to face adversity. And this is where it's so important to be wise and not to react the way the people are attacking you. We have it in the Quran, which is exactly the way he was doing this, is They attack you, respond in the best way. If you go to Pharaoh, for example, Pharaoh, and this is what was asked, uh, uh, to, uh, uh, the, the God asked Moses and his brother to go and to talk to someone who was killing, who was destroying the, the, the earth. And he was saying, I'm the best, I'm God on earth. This is what Pharaoh was saying in Egypt. What they are asked to say is something which in the best way. Talk to him in a soft way. Say the truth, but it doesn't mean that you have to be aggressive. And for us, when we are in, in this country and we have some of the Tea Party's people and saying, well, be careful with the Muslims, they are colonizing the country. We have some Muslims reacting exactly the wrong way which is reacting in an aggressive mode to an aggressive attack. And if you come back to spirituality, it's never this. is to control your emotion when you are attacked, knowing that sometimes you, the people who are attacking you are helping, to be, are helping you to be better. وَعِبَادُ الرَّحْمَنَ الَّذِينَ يَمْشُونَ عَلَى الْأَرْضِ هَوْنًا وَإِذَا خَاتَبَهُمُ الْجَاهِلُونَ قَالُوا السَّلَامًا the people who are serving God are, are working on, on the earth in a very soft and humble way. And when the people who are ignorant are attacking them or uh, 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 rejecting them, uh, are talking to them, they say, peace, peace be with you. I'm not going to respond to this. And if you come to his life, you understand that, yes, at one point when it was a question of survival, he had to resist with weapons. He did this. But the great majority of the time, what we had coming from the prophet's life was, I know that I'm going to face you, but I'm not going to react the way you want me to react. Why? Because I'm not the object of your attack. I'm the subject of my mission. She's not the same. I decide for myself, I control the emotion, and this is the spiritual dimension. And for us, when we are today facing attacks and people who are so harsh with our religion, we have to ask ourselves first, from within, we understand that sometimes it's our fault. We don't convey the right. And sometimes we are very much at the periphery. We keep on repeating, we are nice people. It's not going to work saying, I'm nice. So, okay, thank you. I want to see this. I want to see it, it has to be visible. Our contribution within our society should be visible, not out of words, but out of active contribution to the society. And he was like this. He was very much trying to respond, not directly to the attacks, but 
to something which is. We understand that in spirituality, it's not you are facing things that are sometimes attacking you and sometimes obstacles. So you have inner obstacles and you have outward obstacles. And the first one, which is essential for any spiritual life, it's strange, but this is the way, it's death. And we have this in the Quran. الَّذِي خَلَقَ الْمَوْتَ وَالْحَيَاةَ لِيَبْلُوَكُمْ أَيُّكُمْ أَحْسَنُ عَمَلًا He created death and life to just assess who is acting the best. And we need to get it right. If you want to get a deep spiritual life, you should remember from time to time that life is ending. That you are not, you are not eternal. That it has an end. And it's important. You have two ways of, you know, Blaise Pascal, the French philosopher, was saying the problem with human beings that you cannot take someone and put him or her in a room, a closed room, and ask him to ponder. He's going to be scared because he's going to face his or her own, life, own, own death. But spirituality is connected to this. Is the very meaning of life is coming from this question about our own death. So it's one of obstacle to our happiness is sometimes to say, it's going to happen. Even when we get married, even if you find someone that you love, you need to be humble enough to say, I love you, we are going to be together for a while, but it's going to stop. It's going to stop. The best love story is going to an end. And this is to be prepared, is to put meaning in this, is to be humble, to understand that we are doing our best that there is an end to everything. So these are obstacles. And then the people around you. So if you look at his life, you will find that all these circles, all these dimensions are there. And you have to ponder over all these dimensions and telling us, first, respect your questions. Second, master and control your emotions. Third, respond to the questions. Fourth, try to get peace, inner peace and peace within your society. And inner peace means acknowledge the fact that you have needs. Be close to your body, close to your heart, close to your mind, and close to your society. And having said all this, this is going to be and should be visible in your life today by being also involved in all this dimension in your life. First, in spreading around education within your society. Second, solidarity. It's, it's critical in Islam. It's one of the pillars of Islam is to show solidarity to people around you. It's a zakat, it's a, 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 a duty, and it's a, 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 a social purifying tax for the poor. They have a right on your, uh, on your money. So this solidarity within the society is, is something which is part of the spiritual life. You want to have a spiritual life today? Ask yourself, how is your relationship with education or self-education, with your intellect? Second, what is your relationship with the poor people, with the people who are marginalized? Yesterday I was in Washington and we were talking about homeless women and domestic violence. It's about solidarity, but it's also about justice. No, don't talk about solidarity with disconnecting it with, from justice. We should not disconnect solidarity with justice. We are going to, be, to show solidarity, but justice is, uh, is, is essential in anything that we have to do to promote human dignity. And this is the way he was. Around the mosque in Medina, there were people who were all poor. He was putting the poor people around the mosque just to tell to the people, when you go to pray God, you just go and you will see the poor in order to worship him and to serve them. You enter to the mosque for him and for yourself. You go out of the mosque for him and for them. So there is no way to have a spiritual life if you don't have. And even more than that, what he was asking was even to love the poor. Allahumma nas'aluka hubb al-masakin. We are asking you to love them, not only to serve them, but put love in our heart towards the poor. And when we see what is happening in our societies today, in the United States of America, and the Muslim majority countries, there is one common disease. This disrespect towards the poor people. That they are not 
you know, it's as if we have second-class human beings. And our understanding of justice is something, because, you know, I will talk about this tomorrow when I'm asked, you have to assert the fact that we are European or Western citizens for, for you American citizens, that's all good. But what about what we say about immigrants, the way we treat immigrants, because they don't have the citizen status, we can treat them as if they were less human? In Europe, the way we deal with immigrants is just not right. So everything has to do with human dignity here, has to do with this social dimension, which is so important. Something which is also clear in, in this spirituality is you see how the messenger was dealing with women. And we can say now that in many Muslim majority countries and in many Muslim uh, communities, we are not doing the job, that's not right. The way he was pushing women uh, in all the fields and respecting them, asking education, requesting them to be educated, to be involved in the society, to be autonomous subject and not uh, 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 relying only on men. This is something which is Islam against the patriarchal cultures of his time. This is also something that we need to get in our understanding and the way he was. And the two last things that were important. When he arrived in Medina, the first thing that he did after uh, building a mosque was to change the rules in the market. Meaning what we need today is ethics in economy. That we need to stop, you know, uh, thinking about only making money and speculation and, and interest is fair trade is essential. And it has to do with a spiritual take on economy that we need also to think about this. We, we need to have ethics. You know, I don't buy all this business about Islamic economy, Islamic finance. I prefer to speak about, in the book, uh, uh, radical reform. I'm explaining that I prefer to speak about ethics in economy and ethics in politics. Because I don't think that we have a specific Islamic economy. I think that we have ethics and ethical values that we have to promote. So the point here is really to get that right, to, to, to be able to promote that. And if you look at the way he was dealing with the market, the way he was dealing with politics, the way he was giving the floor to people to address, to be critical towards him when he was a, a, a leader, someone came to him and said, is this coming from the Quran? It's coming from you. It's, it's coming from me. That's always wrong. He was giving the floor. He was opening up a way for the people to express themselves. And he was surrounded by people who were using their critical mind, which is exactly the opposite of what sometimes we do in our community when we teach Islam. It's just you repeat what I'm saying, which is not ex it's exactly the opposite of what I was saying at the beginning, is respecting the questions, opening up critical thinking. This is what we got out of his life. So he would promote, if we have to ask, promote this critical thinking today and ethics in all these fields as something which is the true translation of a spiritual life. So it's respect your heart, listen to your mind, and serve the people around you. And the last point is use the diversity and take the best of everything which is people who are not coming from your own tradition. And this is why I think that we have to be serious about pluralism today. Pluralism, it's, it's a serious question, is to, you know, when we have in the Quran, you made you tribes and nations in order for, each, for, for you to know each other. But we need to be serious about that. What do you know about the other traditions? What do we, how much time we take to understand what is the Jewish tradition, the Christian tradition, the Muslim tradition, the Buddhist tradition, the philosophical tradition. We speak about opening our minds, but we only speak, we don't learn. We don't read, we don't meet, we don't sit, we don't listen. And this is the way he was doing with people. He was dealing with Christians, he was dealing with Jews, he was protecting them, and sometimes he had to fight. But the point is really about the essence of this mutual knowledge, is to stand for knowledge and justice. And knowledge is justice, and justice is a condition of uh, the right knowledge. Because if you are knowledgeable, you are uh, uh, showing justice to your mind. I think that these, all these dimensions, it's important from a spiritual, uh, uh, um, the, the, the spiritual uh, dimension of his life. But it's very much a, a way uh, for us to understand our life 
today with our own heart, our own mind, and our fellow human beings, men and women. Thank you. Um, so before we open up...